Joined by Mike Dettelier, SaintsReport.com, MikeDettelier.com, and now part of Maven Media. Uh, we'll tell you more about his uh, new... Well, actually, I'll tell you what, I know it's part of the Sports Illustrated Network. Mike, how are you, man? Um, I've been better, but I'm good. I, I know that, man. <laughs> so, wait, so tell us about the new uh, Sports Illustrated affiliation where people can find your stuff there, too. Yeah, well, uh, Kyle Mosley, who's involved... Uh, uh, with Maven Media and, and Sports Illustrated, it's now a pretty much an online uh, services, and uh, you can, you know, they they sort of branched out in different deals. And he's approached me a couple, three, maybe four. I hate to say it, three, maybe four times. And um, you know, finally, um, he gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. And so we've come up with off this. It'll be off the Saints News Network, also Bayou Blitz, uh, Saints Bayou Blitz, I think is how it's called. But I know it's Saints News Network. And uh, I'll be doing a couple columns a month. I did one last month, uh, you know, just about a, a little over a week ago on, on the draft, uh, uh, pecking order, so to speak. And, and I'll do one next week. Uh, we're going to do one on the second tier of receivers uh, that I think is that's the intrigue. And it's going to be a big buildup because of all the wideouts. And, you know, we've talked about it on this show for so long about so many wideouts in this draft class and, I've never seen it in my time frame, that many of them in my top 100. And so I'll be doing that. Also, we're going to be doing some podcasts and, and different things once free agency cranks up and everything else. So, uh, yeah, we'll be, uh, I'll be involved with them. And, uh, you know, it won't interrupt my, uh, my everyday life, I guess. Uh, <laughs> of, other stuff, of, of other coordinating and supervising. So we, we all good with it, but, uh, Kyle and, uh, thanks news, uh, a network in the Maven, uh, they made it happen. All uh, through Sports Illustrated. So if you go to si.com and you go slash NFL the, and then the Saints page there, you'll see uh, the Saints News Network where you can find Mike, some Mike D stuff now as well. Uh, Mike, let's delve into it. First of all, uh, Joe Burrow has uh, teeny tiny hands. Who knew? Uh, how big of a deal is uh, Joe Burrow having teeny tiny hands? Don't make a damn bit of difference to me. <laughs> I mean, but again, it is what it is, and you – you know, this time of year, I think people are looking for stories. And you know, this is, I think, sort of the narrative from some people to knock Joe. I mean, you know, he's ridden the wave. So now this is part of a, a little bit of a deal if you're not affiliated with the SEC in any manner, uh, just to sort of undercut him. Uh, almost like what he's done on the field has made no difference. And I've tried to explain this to different people because they said, well, look the big difference he made from his junior to his senior year. Okay, he hadn't played in three years. Let me take you off the air, Matt, for three years and then put you back on. Are you going to be as good as you were when you, I took you off? Hell, yeah. Boom. I'm not going <laughs> to say the rest of it because they're going to believe me, but I know better than that. <laughs> Come on, anything you do, you know, a lot of times – even when I would take vacations at certain jobs, and you come back, it, it, you sort of got to get jump started a little bit uh, back into the groove. You know what to do, but maybe you aren't doing it at that same pace. And uh, I, all I know is they talk about the Joe Moore Award given this year. Was that offensive line there in 2018? Absolutely not. They, they didn't protect Burrow like they did <laughs> uh, last year. Uh, the receiving core had, you know, a couple of uh, freshmen in there, Jamar Chase, Terrace Marshall. You had a lot more drops. I think they were one of the leaders in drop passes, and it was something Joe Brady brought up to me. Like, I got to work on these receivers. Catch it first. Don't worry about what you're going to do after the catch. Catch it first. And I don't remember the number he was having them catch kind of on their own in the off season. So all those elements came into play into why only thing I know is he won 10 games. He lost a seven uh, overtime game to A&M as part of that. Now, Alabama blew him out, but, you know, the game against, um, you know, Florida was, was close till the end. But you understand why that first time that as a starter at the collegiate level and and the, the big jump this year and certainly the offense being put in by Ensminger and Joe uh, certainly had a big part into it. But um, I think you're just looking for a story here uh, at this point. And I think Joe handled it well. You know, just to flip it off, you know, my career is over with and everything else. Uh, so it's Joe being Joe, um, you know, and 
whatever. If you think that's a big thing, then you're putting away all the things that he's done in the past. Did the ball look like it was too big for him making throws against <laughs> Alabama or Florida <laughs> or Georgia or Oklahoma or Clemson? You know, he's just a winner. And what, what they're not giving him credit for, I think, is two things. One, his great accuracy skills. You can't teach that. Either you have it or you don't. Uh, I, I, it's almost like teaching somebody in trig, and they're a C minus student. You might get them a little bit of help, and they can maybe get it to a B minus, but they're never going to be an A an A student. I mean, you you are who you are. Joe is who he is. He's an accurate thrower. And the second thing too is between the ears, the intelligence, and I think that that gets overlooked. And while we're going to see the next few days, all these running drills and jumping and lifting weights. Uh, intelligence. You know, this stuff about a dumb football player, no, they might do some dumb things off the field, which sometimes we all do dumb things, but you you understand of concepts and schemes and knowing what to do and knowing what not to do on every play. You, I'm not talking about splitting the atom or being a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, but you got to be football smart. Joe is at the highest level at that point in being able to process this and his toughness. So there is some intangibles part of that. And, you know, all I knew is Mahomes was not in a quarter. <clears throat> Has it hurt him? It'll be, oh, well, he got a rocket arm. Okay, I, I get it. But everybody's got strengths and weaknesses in their game. And so it's a lot to be made about zero, zero. Put him some talent on that Cincinnati team, and you'll see just how good he's going to be. Mike, there is a little bit of news today out of the combine. Curious your thoughts on this. Uh, this is from Tom Pelissero on Twitter. Said LSU tight end Thad Moss is physical at the combine, reveals a Jones fracture in his right foot, so he'll have surgery uh, should be healthy in plenty of time for the rookie year, but that's that. Uh, that's why he's not going to participate. That's eight or nine weeks. So he's not going to participate in drills at the combine. Does that affect his draft stock in any way? Not participating today, or yeah, I, listen, I would presume Mike also that would that would include pro day. It include pro day. That's a basically an eight week to nine week injury uh, to it. He's not the only one. Van Jefferson, yeah, also from uh, University of Florida. Man, I don't know that Jones fracture. Man, the way I've been getting things. <laughs> I better not walk around too much, man, because uh, that might happen to me too. But uh, uh, it's it's an injury that will take you about eight to nine weeks to fully heal. So that would basically eliminate his pro day. Uh, but I think you've seen enough of him. And I will say this, uh, and I was saving it for later, but I'll give it to you anyway. He is the the one guy I've gotten more phone calls from what I call double scouts, guys, guys double-checking their Southeastern scout about has been Thaddeus Moss. And it's not even close. Uh, mm. People asking a lot of questions about that. And, you know, every year there's a guy there. And last year before he ran, who did I tell you? Foss tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden people were like, man, you got to tell me a little bit about Foss tomorrow, you know, because, you know, what he did and kind of how he's built. It doesn't quite equate. You've got to sort of explain the fact that he was used like a glorified tackle. And, you know, LSU's offensive line just wasn't very good in 2018. So they had to keep him in. They didn't put him out in throws. But uh, I don't think it's going to hurt him much. There's a lot of interest in Thad Moss. And in certain schemes now where that tight end's flex, that's exactly what Thad can do. I mean, he can catch the football. He's got a little bit of scoot after the catch. But his ability – to set up a defender and get separation is really good. And we saw it all year long. There were certain down and distance situations with Joe that you could see he, he was eyeballing Thad. And, and a lot of times that's communication. That, hey, listen, Joe, you need a play. I got one. You know, I can get open. And I, I still think he'll be third, fourth round pick. I think he'll be a middle round type guy. And uh, we'll see how just how quickly all those receivers come off the board. But uh, I don't think it's going to hurt him a lot. Um, I think teams know what he can do and what he can't do. And a lot of this Olympic stuff, uh, that, that wasn't really built for Thad either. 
He's Mike Dettelier on Twitter, at Mike Dettelier. You know that Olympic stuff wasn't built for you or me, is it, Mike? Mike, it was actually a busy uh, week coaching news-wise, and that continued today. But let's start back with the beginning of the week where we found out that Tommy Robinson is leaving LSU, heading to Texas A&M, and writing was on the wall to promote Kevin Falk. How big of an addition is this, Mike, with Kevin being promoted from an off-field role to an on-field role? Yeah, we sort of all knew that this was going to happen. You, <laughs> I don't know kind of when the word got out. But, you know, when I think a coach uh, last year, Tommy, got interviewed for a couple other jobs in the off season. It didn't work out for him. But almost from that moment, <laughs> you had a feeling, you know, it, the door was open and that Kevin was going to come in and, and take over being the running backs coach. Um, before he got affiliated with LSU, Kevin used to come to our uh, Elias camp uh, at Nichols every year, and um, it was to see the kids' reaction to him. I mean, he had just recently sort of retired from the game, and you know, their eyes a big like half dollars, uh, you know, because not only do they remember him, but you know their dads or uncles or whoever remember Kevin Falk too. And so uh, I think uh, in that manner, you know, he knows how to play this game at a certain level. And what what was he best known for, you know, in the pros? His catching ability the ball. to catch yeah, the ball no coming doubt. out of the backfield. Man, that, to me, is a big part of the college and pro game today. So, I mean, it's no, certainly no shock uh, on that part. Uh, Robinson going to A&M now is a little bit different because I think a lot of people felt he may land a pro job and then it all of a sudden became looked as though he would go to South Carolina and he ends up going to Texas A&M. So that's an interesting little twist there of him ending up with the Aggies uh, instead of – because I do know he interviewed for two pro jobs uh, a year ago. And so, you know, it, I think it's a nice addition to the staff to have a former player, a guy from Louisiana. All the coaches knew him. He was coaching, I think, at Karen Crow, if my mind's uh, yeah, right when, with that. At, when his at son that was there. Yep, you're right. Yeah, he was coaching at Karen Crow. Uh, and uh, he would work out, you know, with the, the running backs and, and quarterbacks uh, and, and that sort of thing. So I think that's a really good addition to LSU. And, again, when he walks in a, in somebody's house, and I'm Kevin Falk, and you're from Louisiana, you do remember. And, you know, he, I think he gets underrated for what he did at a time that while a lot of young men leaving the state of Louisiana, <laughs> it yeah. was like a mass Essex, Essex, exodus out. And he decided to stay. He could have went anywhere in the country. And he decided to stay here at LSU. And the impact he had with, with LSU's program at that time, because he could have easily went to Florida State, to Texas, Oklahoma. I mean, you, you name it. He had every offer out there. And he decided to stay here. And, uh, again, he was a former quarterback that got put to the running back position. Man, he was one big-time player. And underrated for what he did to start even before Nick, at least you were keeping that core guy here in the state when many of them were leaving. Mike, I, I don't think there's any doubt, and everybody talks about Kevin Falk from players, staff members, they just rave about the job he's done. Uh, the other one, Mike, that we heard a lot of buzz about was DJ Mangus. There's a yep. possibility even to replace Joe Brady because there's similarities, their ties at William and Marion on through. And Mangus, many people probably don't know, but was as an analyst at, at LSU. And now it looks like Joe Brady's taking him with him to Carolina. There's a report from Joe Person, uh, I think he was with The Athletic, who basically... Yeah, Joe, uh, yeah, I, I know Joe well. And uh, I, actually, he called me about it uh, to get a little bit of insights on, on DJ. And, you know, DJ was here because of Joe. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their relationship, very, very close from back in the William & Mary days. And uh, I heard nothing but high remarks about DJ. And him and Joe work together closely. And a lot of this, and it sort of throws it back to uh, what O was looking for as a passing game coordinator. One of the things Joe told me that Mangas did really well was uh, different protections and different plays, third down red zone. He said that was, was his specialty. Mm -hmm. He knew that so well. And the type of protection you needed and where the blitz was going to come from, where the pressure was going to come from, where you needed to make that hit. 
and he Joe was like he had a, a thick of papers uh, that he would give you about. Okay, if it's third and seven, we doing this. If it's third and eleven, we doing this. You know, and he said he was just so good at it, breaking down what teams were going to throw at you in that down and distant situation. But his specialty was pass protection uh, in the blitz situations, obvious third down passing plays, red zone. Listen, that's critical. That's really critical. And what did what did Ole say as soon as he made his passing game coordinator decision with Lanahan? Talked about the red. He talked about the red zone and third down. <laughs> exactly. So you know that sort of went hand in hand while Joe working with the receivers in the pitch and catch part of the game. DJ was sort of brought in to a give. Tell me what the looks are going to be like if we in this down and distance situation. And DJ did a great job. I know Coach O, uh, in, in talking to him about DJ, he praised him about just how thorough he was. Uh, I mean, basically kind of gave you every little angle to look at in down and distance situations. As soon as Scott got the job, I'll be honest with you, I thought he would leave because mm-hmm. if he's not involved, um, then, you know, I, I thought either he'd go to Baylor or he would be at Carolina with Joe. Hmm. And so that, that's a loss from an analyst standpoint because he was very good at that. And I'm not, not just coming from one person. That's coming from a number of people that saw what he did, his work out on the field. He was a former college player. He understood the pitch and catch part of the game. But he also understood, I think, what has become such a critical area. And that is that, Third down, conversion down, red zone, scoring touchdowns. And and always brought it up so many times about, hey, listen, today is all about scoring sevens and giving up a three if you're going to give it up. Mm -hmm. And and how that sort of piles up on you. And DJ did a very good job. He's he's a really good coach. And I think certainly the connection there with Brady was was obvious. So when – when it was Scott getting the job, I, I just thought it was a matter of time. Uh, DJ would, would either go to Baylor um, or he would head to, to Carolina. And it took a couple of weeks, but he's out with the Panthers. And, and he'll do a good job with them. And that's a loss for LSU. Mike, collectively, one I'm more. interested to see who gets that assignment. The analyst at LSU? The, the, that job of what DJ was doing. I'm interested to see who's the guy that now is going to handle that because they do so much background work and looking at an opponent uh, beforehand and seeing the type defenses that they run and what they're going to show you and then how to combat it. That third down situation, and again, it was something that was brought up with Scott. I knew he had said it ahead of time. Uh, that that was an area he he really believes in has to can be improved and at the NFL you do it at the highest level okay it's the, you know you you play in NFL football that's nothing better than that who takes over DJ's job now you got any who's names who's going to be that guy now <laughs> to come up and give Scott that information and say hey listen on third and seven or third and eleven or third and fourteen this is what you're going to see. This is how we're going to run it and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm interested in that part. Mike D, there's so many NFL storylines kind of percolating surrounding the combine and and free agency here in a few weeks. Uh, Let me get a few thoughts from you on a couple of these topics, most notably uh, the CBA and a lot of the angst among the players. Do you have a feeling on whether or not the the full membership of the NFL players is going to vote to approve this CBA in a 17th game? I think they will. Hmm. You know, a, a lot of you, know, you look at the players, the majority of them are, are young players, first, second, third year guy. For them, this means like a $100,000 a year raise from the lowest level. Hmm. So for them guys, that deal is, man, I'm voting for my, in my pocketbook. Um, we'll figure all this other stuff out later. And I you know, again, the the owners have the advantage here. There's there's no question. If this gets approved, it, it's an ownership deal again with their advantage. But for the lower end players, this does mean um, basically like a hundred thousand dollar a year raise for them. 
So if you're making 380 and you're now all of a sudden going to make 480, uh, Matt, that's a pretty decent raise, right? That's a hell <laughs> so of a raise, man. Them, them guys is give me that thing and I'll sign it. Now, if you are a player making a lot of money, you see some of the flaws in the system. What I don't like about this, and I think the players had them a little bit by the teriyaki and let them loose, is that um, – <laughs> no, I ain't kidding you. The, the, the guy that uh, – the, the NFL PA people, where are they? They are hiding in the woods. You haven't heard a word from any of them. None from D, none of them. Uh, now, all of a sudden now, uh, Eric, Eric Winston's the only guy I can say. He, he has made that a comment about it. Uh, but – my thing about it is, wasn't this a place here where you could have extended the rosters to 60? You had a 53-man squad. Now, you know what the owners are giving them? Two extra players. Mm-hmm. And two extra players on game day. My thing is, none of this. we got a 53-man roster. That's how many is going to play on game day. I agree. And the roster expands to 60. To me, what... This is nickel and diamond things here, as far as I'm concerned. The NFLPA had them in a spot to negotiate this up and didn't. Two players? Come on. You're not doing your job. If that's what you got out of that deal for extra players on a roster is two and not to have 53 men active on game day. That, to me, is ridiculous. You let them off the hook there in that spot. The owners are worried about their cut of the pie and what they're going to get TV-wise and everything else. Uh, so they're going to get their money. My thing about it is, if I'm the NFL PA, I, I, certainly the higher wages for the lower part of the rosters, I get that. And I think it's admirable that you can get that type of money jump of hundred grand. But my thing goes back on the flip of that is, why are you just settling for two extra players? And two extra players on game day. Yep. You have a 53-man squad. To me, all 53 should be active on game day. And if you're going to have a deal like that, extend the rosters to 60 and have those seven inactive. I, I just don't understand why that was not a bigger push into this. If you're going to agree to the 17-game schedule, then the owners, I think, would have would have kicked that in. I think, but again, it was I think pushed uh, by Demar Smith and his group. I don't think they were pushing that. Why? My thing is, why wouldn't you? Aren't you coming up for a vote for the NFL PA president? No. Nope. Wouldn't you want to say, "Hey, listen, I hey, I helped get that jobs for you," but I don't get it. Apparently, uh, these guys here uh, and how they cooking this deal, I, I have no idea what they're thinking of and what they're not here uh, on this spot. But, the, again, if you look at that agreement, it favors the owners overwhelmingly in compared to the players. Mike, what about Tom Brady? Report today that uh, his representatives have visited with three teams already, none of which are the Patriots. Are, are you buying that Tom Brady won't be back in New England? I'm buying this. He's making a lot of noise that he wants out. But this would be the thing I would worry about, and, and maybe – it's these psychology classes ain't good for me uh, when I was younger. <laughs> but, you know, if somebody's upset with me and they're squawking about it to me, they want me to talk to them about it, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, if they don't say a word, that's when I'd be scared. Uh, and Brady's leaking all this out that, you know, hey, listen, I'm talking – to the Titans, and I'm going to talk to the Chargers, and I'm going to talk to the Raiders, and I'm going to talk to the Colts. Uh, okay, he's basically sending the message to the Patriots. I, I really would like to stay if we can work this out, but the, he's not getting anything back in return. If he returns to the Patriots, it's not because of Belichick. It's because of Robert Kraft. His relationship with Mr. Kraft, I think, is as close as as a player or owner can have. And I do believe Robert Kraft wants him back. But is this marriage that torn that he would say, I'm going to give this up and I'm going to go play with the Titans? But I think this is the first salvo by the Brady camp to say, hey, 
talk to us. I still want to hear from you. Because if I didn't want to hear from you, I would do it in secret and wouldn't say a word. I would be scared of the secrecy part, much more so than that being leaked out to certain people in the media. And and even Jeff Darlington, and I'm not saying Jeff's not connected into that, but why would Brady tell him that? Would it be Brady or would it be Brady's agent? Well, I'm sure Brady's agent with the goodwill of Tom right. is leaking that out to certain people. Uh, you know, he's doing his job into that part. Matt, I think it's it's just a strange twist here because this is the first time that I think it's legit that they would look to leave if it's not the right deal mm. and the right promises from New England. I think Tom would be willing to leave. But him coming out with this, I think, does send a signal to Robert Kraft, I'm willing to talk to you. I want to see if we can work this out. Because if he had really felt, this is it, I'm never going to play back in New England, I ain't telling you a word. I'm not telling you one word about it. Uh, So maybe the psychologist part of me thinks that that's how I look at Brady, that he is very calculated on every move he has made in his life, very much so. And I do think that this leaking of information is a last sort of olive branch out to the Patriots. Hey, listen, come talk to me and see if we can't work this out. But if he doesn't get that call from Robert Kraft, then I think he's gone. Hmm. But I would not be shocked at all that he ends up back with New England. Mike, we know Drew Brees is going to be back in New Orleans. Uh, Mickey Loomis at the Combine today said they'd like to have a deal done with Drew before March 18th, before the start of free agency. Is that something that you think is realistic that they get that done? They probably would do it March 17th. (laughs) <laughs> I no, thought that I, would always I, be the case with Tom Benson. He'd say, "Go, well, you know." He'd say, "Go get it done. Stop, stop playing patty cake. Go do it." Uh, because I do think once a deadline, yeah, maybe okay, a little bit too many deals for me too on this. But I think once you set a deadline and say, "That's how I want it done," normally that's when you get it done. It, it's a late deal. You, you know, you get it done late in the process. And I, I would wouldn't be surprised March sixteenth, seventeenth. That's when you things things start to heat up uh, between Breeze and the Saints. And I do think already the word on exactly how much it would cost you and the length of that deal, because that's going to be the other part. It's going to be a multi-year deal. That doesn't mean Breeze is going to play that, but that's the ability to kick that money can farther down the road. Eventually, you're going to have to pay off the credit card, Okay. That's obvious. You're going to have to pay it off. But I think this is, if you sign him to a multi-year deal, it's the ability to kick it down the road a little bit. Uh, I think the reality is Drew's going to play this year, and that's going to be the end of the story. But the deal will be a multi-year deal because, again, that money is going to come due, and the way they've been able to finagle these contracts, you can kick that money can a little bit farther down the road for them. And so uh, I think March 16th, 17th, that's when you'll see a deal for Breeze. Final segment here with Mike Dettelier. We'll get to your questions and your questions only for Mike D. Of course, you can find Mike's work at saintsreport.com, mikedettelier.com. Order your M&D draft report. Mike now working with the uh, Saints News Network, part of uh, si.com. So you can check out Mike's stuff there as well. Lots of ways to get Mike D's content all over the place. All right, Mike, let's start. Uh, Twitter questions. First up, Mark Shelton Ask Mike, what veteran wide receiver should the Saints pursue in free agency? If his money wouldn't be extreme, it would, to me, be Sanders uh, for the 49ers. Um, I don't know what type of money he's looking for, but I think Emmanuel in that slot uh, I think would be a really good uh, pickup for them. Uh, Sean Payton's brought up about speed, and, and I do think that Sanders would bring you that uh, that speed inside, that speed quickness in that slot position. Now, again, it's going to cost you a lot of money, though, uh, because there's not going to be a lot of those type guys loose. Uh, and so I do think the Saints will sign a veteran free agent, wide receiver, but I do think that they're going to spend an early round pick on a, a wide receiver, too. But Sanders would be my number one choice if the money was right. Uh, Brian Robert asked Mike, will Stingley really play offense? And if so, 
uh, where and would that take him off of return duties? Uh, that's an easy one. Yes, he will play on offense, and he'll be a wide out. And I think you would see him used on some of the jet sweep plays. Uh, and no, he is still going to be a returner. He's still going to be the return man. Uh, so uh, that, that was that would have been a lot to put on the plate for him as a freshman. But I got no doubt that um, it was – uh, sort of uh, maybe a, a little verbal agreement. Hey, we, we're going to play you on offense. And I, I do think that uh, you will see him on offense mm. as a wide out jet sweep guy. He will return, still return punts. And he's he's a unique athlete. And, man, I just I, – I never understood why Les didn't do it with Tyron Matthew. Mm. I, wouldn't we have all loved to see just that little short pass out in the swing pass and let Tyron take off with it? I hadn't thought about it, Mike, but I'll tell you this, the other thing, too, is you, you struggle so much finding ways to get the offensive athletes you have the ball. Does it become even slimmer pickings if, if Stingley's over there taking reps? I, I think it would be a down-and-distance situation. He's not going to uh, do this uh, 10 plays out of a game. Mm -hmm. But I think if you could pick out a couple different spots for him, and all I know is if I'm a defensive coordinator and I see Stingley go on the field, hey, wait a minute, we gotta, well, you better watch on him. I also use him as a decoy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's any doubt of that possibility. I, I'm just telling you, there's going to be different spots where you can be innovative with this, with Stingley, and not so much all the time him touching it, just him being out on the field, I think is going to cause uh, a, a lot of – all you want is one guy to make a mistake on defense. One mental mistake. Bang. And with that group that they got you know, coming back with Terrace, and with Jamar, uh, you make a mistake, you're going to be in big trouble. Todd Dupree on Twitter asked, Mike, a surprise player not returning to the Saints next year. Anybody think walks in free agency would be a surprise, Mike? Oh, man, that's a pretty good question. Um, I don't know if it would be a surprise. I'm interested in what happens with A.J. Klein, who has been a solid player for them. Um, in free that that he would have an opportunity because it's not a real thick market at linebacker uh, position. Um, I, I do know they need help at corner. I, I can't think of anybody that would be to me a surprise. I think we all know that Pete's going to leave. Mm -hmm. The surprise would be if Pete stayed. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> See, Mike, we bringing up Klein. I wanted to ask you. So let me get it in here. Uh, Michael Hodges taking over for Mike Nolan as linebacker coach. Thoughts there? Man, he got some big moccasins to fill. Yeah, right. Man, Mike Nolan was terrific coach. I mean, really, really terrific coach. And so Mike comes in. He had some understudy under Nolan. Um, man, it's a position today that's difficult to coach. And, and Mike has talked about it with us on some of the coaches shows that, uh, you know, years ago you didn't have to worry about matching up with that third receiver or that athletic tight end or that athletic running back. Now that linebacker's got to do it. That's some big shoes. Uh, you know, Mike's got some experience there, but, man, is, is that a big job that he's got to fill? Because I thought Nolan got every bit of vitamin C out of the orange juice. And look what he did for Demario Davis. No doubt. Who was a good player in the league. Now he's an upper echelon player in this league. Keith Walker asked Mike the impact of Scott Cochran leaving Alabama for Georgia. Uh, I think it's a big plus for Georgia, whose special teams has been El Succo uh, throughout the years. I mean, I, you know, in big games, hasn't that been almost a tripwire for them? That they've had a screw up somewhere there. Uh, Nick O'Hara, a good uh, strength and conditioning coach, uh, to fill his shoes. Uh, it's more of a plus for Georgia. Uh, but I think that, you know, sometimes you've been with a, a guy for a long time. And there was no doubt Scott went to him and said, I want to coach on the field, and Nick didn't want it. So I think this was sort of a mutual agreement. Hey, if you got a chance, you got to take it. But it is a loss for Alabama, who hire a really good special team, I mean a really good strength and conditioning coach. But it's a big plus for Georgia. Man, their special teams has really not played well. And in crucial games, have fallen apart. And who come up with that, that fake – uh, field goal deal. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, of all people, that guy is going to outrun an LSU player to the edge. Who come up with that play? So, 
you can see in those sort of spots where um, – and Scott wants to be a head coach one day. And he's not going to be that being the strength coach at Alabama. Well, you're right about that. That's an interesting uh, plot twist there. Ask Mike. Oh, we've got less than two minutes. Ask Mike, what about A.J. Green to the Saints? You know, I've heard Sean talk about speed and that sort of thing. So, I'm, I, you know, A.J., 32 years old, didn't play a year ago. Um, how much money factor is going to be involved in that? That's going to come into play here because you've got so many guys that you're looking for to try to resign. Do you want to get into a money game with someone uh, for a 32-year-old receiver? It's the same sort of thing with Sanders. Do you want to get into a bidding war for that particular deal? But I think Sean would like a speed guy, to be honest with you. I think that he's telling you before the, the Super Bowl, he was sort of telling you what was in his head and what he was thinking about uh, A.J. years ago. Man, he was a spectacular player. But we're talking about the 32-year-old A.J. Green. Not the 22-year-old. Mike, we're under a minute. Is there a quarterback in the middle rounds the Saints can keep an eye on? You know, as a kid at Hawaii, Cole McDonald, mm. who I really like. I mean, he's got some uh, quirky mannerisms with him, but he's a big arm guy who's athletic. I've seen him in down-distance situations where he's, he's a really good prospect. You could, he's going to need a little bit of work. But, uh, man, I, I think a lot of Cole McDonald from Hawaii. SaintsReport.com, MikeDetillier.com. Read about Cole McDonald in the M&D Draft Report. Order it right now at SaintsReport.com or MikeDetillier.com. And find Mike's work now on the Saints News Network at SI.com. Mike, you the man. We appreciate you for toughing it out today, man. We'll talk next week. We'll do it. Thank you, brother.